All right, thank you everybody for uh, being here, taking some time out for our Green Bank Observatory uh, bi-weekly science chats. So I'm Karen O'Neill, I'm the director of Green Bank Observatory. So today we're gonna have a brief introduction as always by me, just talking a little bit about some of the things going on at the observatory. And then we'll get on to our key science talk by Adam Ginsberg, who'll be talking about some new Mustang II results of the galactic plane. So with that, just a little update on what's going on here uh, at the observatory in around West Virginia. Like much of the country, like much of the world, the number of uh, COVID tests is back on the rise again. So about 5% of all tests currently are positive within the state of West Virginia. Uh, much more locally, uh, the local uh, preschool through middle school was shut down last week due to a few cases uh, with the teachers, the intent is to prevent an outbreak. Uh, so the school is not in full outbreak yet, but preventing it. So that's had a few uh, few ripples down into the to the staff at the observatory. But as I said, the good news is they're trying to, to stop things before they get started. So that's good. Again, the GBT remains in full operation 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as always. All of the work is going slowly but safely. We of course have a few more delays due to the local uh, school closures and to prevent an outbreak there. So we have a number of staff that are on quarantine right now, uh, making things just go again, a little bit more slowly than they normally would, but still continuing forward. The high frequency season is well underway. So Adam's talk today is gonna be a great highlight of the types of uh, fantastic science you can get out of the GBT during high frequency season. Now we're really hoping for a good year this year. Lots of nice clear skies like we have right now cold weather, and so lots of chances for high-frequency science on the GBT. Another exciting thing going on is, is next week, we're going to have a proof-of-concept test for a new low-power radar system. So this is just a proof-of-concept. The goal is not uh, amazing science out of this, but to show the idea with this new low-power radar system and to pave the path for potentially a new higher-powered system later in Green Bank's future. Other fun stuff going on on site, our Education and Public Outreach Division is now doing uh, some limited uh, guided walking tours outside. They also have demo days throughout the month of November, as well as some um, lectures, again, held outside under a tent for safety. I, If you happen to be in the area, I think you might want to come down into the area. I strongly encourage you to sign up online so you can go in, you can register to do the, go on the tour, take, a, uh, uh, take in one of the lectures or go through one of the demos. And we're just excited to finally be able to reach back out to the uh, to the general public again, even if it is in a limited way. Also coming up, we have the 2020 Jansky Lecture on November 17th at 7 p.m. This year's Jansky, Jansky Lecturer is Dr. Martha Haynes from Cornell University. This, of course, will be an online event. Uh, we do encourage and need everybody to register for that. So if you're interested in watching the Jansky Lecture, 2020 Jansky Lecture, I encourage you to go onto our website where you'll find the link to sign up for that. And then other things going on, the next observer training workshop is gonna be held February 9th and 10th of next year. It's again, a virtual workshop. So you can sign up online for that. And the single dish training school is uh, currently likely to be moved to fall of next year to try to maximize the possibility of having a face-to-face -face training school. And that will be held here in Green Bank next year. The details on that are coming soon, as well as the registration page. So watch our website for that. So with that, again, I will just say thank you to everybody that's called into this uh, talk and then hand this over to Adam Ginsberg to talk about some fantastic science with the Mustang II receiver. So Adam, off to you. All right, hi folks, thanks for joining. So um, I want to start off by telling you a little bit about how the, the pre technical presentation is working here, because I have a link to the talk that I'm giving. So if you guys want to follow along, if you want to read things that I'm saying, you can just go to this URL. Um, I'm sure we can post a link later. Actually, I could probably just put this link into the chat here. Um, and if you want to actually see like the presenter notes and everything else, you just press S and it'll pop up. So what I'm going to tell you about today is the Mustang Galactic Plane Survey pilot project that we recently completed and talk a little bit about what we'd hope to accomplish with uh, a complete galactic plane survey, northern galactic plane survey. So what we've done so far uh, is use Mustang to map out a couple square degrees in the northern galactic plane. Um, Mustang, so this is Mustang 2, the, the improved version. Uh, it's covering 
the 90 gigahertz range with about nine arc second resolution. And the first results were published earlier this year in the paper uh, that's linked here. So you know, if you go to the, the uh, well, you can just go to ADS, but you can find it's the only paper I've published so far this year. Um, the image I'm showing you right now is uh, part of W43. And it's just one, um, just a hint of some of the interesting stuff that we, we picked up. All right, so the, the data acquisition and data reduction, um, the, the pilot program was only about 18 hours of total time. Um, and most of that was, that was all done by the uh, Mustang 2 data team. Um, the, the instrument team did all of the observing. And then Charles Romero and Simon Dicker did uh, all of the data processing and map making using uh, the Minkazi tool made by another member of the, the Mustang team. So uh, the maps were, of course, made with the normal booster Fedonic scan pattern, which, of course, is a word that I learned from the Green Bank Observer Manual. Um, the largest recovered scale is about four and a quarter arc minutes. Beam size, as I said, is about nine arc seconds. And our sensitivity, which from uh, essentially two passes on most fields, we just do one horizontal and one vertical pass, is getting us to about a millijansky to two millijanskys per beam, depending on how low in the sky we have to go, right? As we go toward the galactic center and we're looking at pretty low elevations, it takes a little bit more. Uh, we're getting, we're slightly noisier. Uh, we found that overall the, the pointing was pretty good. We found, you know, of order five arc second, a little bit less than five arc second offsets with uh, some VLA data. And so we just uh, corrected that by cross correlating, assuming that the VLA data have uh, better pointing. The data have all been released on Dataverse, which again, this is a, a URL you'll be able to go to. And the reduction scripts, and in fact, all the proposals uh, and all the data tables are available on GitHub. So if you want to get any of this, it's there. So what's the overall motivation for, for doing a blind survey of the galactic plane, which this is not. This is telling you about the, uh, I'm going to show you science results from our pilot program, which is not entirely blind. But why should we do a blind survey covering the whole galactic plane? For starters, we hope to find new and unexpected things. Uh, we also want to enable systematic searches for things we do know exist. Um, and on top, if we you know, know where objects are, we want to be able to do uh, systematic spectral energy distribution analyses. Uh, we also want to provide some legacy data products for future surveys. Um, and it's important here to have you know, as good a resolution as we can. And this is where I think GreenBank wins out a lot. Uh, and then finally, having this full survey would give us the possibility of having short spacings for all the continuum data which really is not going to be available by any other means um, particularly at three millimeters green bank's the only instrument uh, mustang on green bank is the only instrument that's going to be able to provide this all right so you know these are sort of generic motivations for a galactic plane survey why are we looking at 90 gigahertz? What's special about this part of the spectrum? And here I'm just grabbing some generic SEDs of galaxies to point out that the three millimeter band is around the global minimum of galactic SEDs. Right now, these are kind of weird ones where they, they've blocked out the starlight. Most galaxies keep going back up over here. But all right, these are this is near the global minimum of a, uh, of a galactic SED where you have dust falling down. Right? Dust is going down as new to the third or fourth power. You've got synchrotron going down from the other side. And what you might have is some uh, optically thick free free emission kind of coming up over here and maybe turning over somewhere near this range. So uh, it's sort of a unique range in that it's one of the darkest parts of the spectrum to look at from the, the global galactic perspective. So I just said uh, these top three points. Um, and in fact, optically thick free free emission may peak around three, three millimeters um, for sources that are really, really optically thick, which means hypercompact H2 regions. There's also the possibility that anomalous microwave emission um, has some, con some component at 90 gigahertz, but it's uh, not terribly well constrained yet. Still, it's an interesting possibility to tackle. All right, so our goal with uh, the Mustang Galactic Plane Survey is to perform a complete Galactic plane survey from about minus five degrees to 55 degrees longitude. And this longitude range uh, contains the highest density of millimeter emission sources. Uh, and we're targeting plus or minus half a degree in galactic latitude because, again, that's where most of the expected emission is. 
This part of the galaxy has been surveyed at every other wavelength that it can be. So we have Spitzer Glimpse, Virtual High Gal, the Bolocam Galactic Plane Survey, the Atlas Gal Galactic Plane Survey, uh, a variety of different SCUBA surveys, SCUBA 2 surveys. And then at longer wavelengths from the VLA, we have the Thor and Glowstar projects and a few others. These are just sort of the most recent uh, VLA projects. But if you look at the wavelength coverage here, we're jumping from one millimeter all the way out to six centimeters. Um, and in that range, there are no galactic plane surveys with better than several arc minute resolution. So we're really getting much, much better resolution in that, that gap. So onto the actual pilot project and the highlights that I want to show you. Um, for the pilot, we selected these 10 uh, cluster forming regions that are essentially our galaxy's most actively star forming clouds. And so the red boxes here are put on top of a Bolocam galactic plane survey image showing you the things that we wanted to do in the pilot. And we got most of these, but we ran out of time. Um, you know, this was, we were awarded the full 30 hours, but the weather didn't cooperate. So we were unable to do these three regions, but we got at least one pass on the rest. And these are the data that comprise the pilot project. So out of these regions, we went in and cataloged the data and uh, found 700 sources just using um, the dendrogram algorithm to pick things out. So of those 700 sources, 73 were unresolved. So the vast majority were at least somewhat resolved. They had um, an extent that we could actually see, which you know, may, not, may mean there's a point source sitting on a diffuse background, or it may mean um, that there's actually just diffuse material. So this histogram is showing the number of sources versus the flux density. And in blue, we have all of them. In the orange, I selected out the ones that do not have either centimeter or millimeter counterparts, meaning they were not detected at immediately shorter or immediately longer wavelengths. Of these, a lot of them turn out to be just kind of fluff that we didn't cross match well enough because if you catalog fluff, it's not going to have the same position as other as fluff at other wavelengths. But some of these are, are potentially interesting sources. We also separated out the compact sources, which are in the, the black histogram here, and then the compact sources not detected at other wavelengths, thinking that those were potentially interesting as things that peak only at three millimeters. So what are these coming from though? We can look at them, look at the, uh, the image of the W43 region again. And what you can see on here is a lot of different sources, right? It's a really nice image with a whole lot of, of stuff going on, but most of the dots that you might pick out by eye are actually uh, extended. We, we were able to resolve them. So those are um, more diffuse star forming regions or H2 regions. And I'll just show you here, anything that's circled is resolved. Anything with an X may have been cataloged as fluff. I'm not going to go into detail about what all these sources are, but I'll point out that this one here is an interesting one we'll talk about in a bit because it turns out to be uh, a star, not a, uh, it's, it's actually an evolved star. So some of the different source classes we found um, by, by cross-matching with both shorter and longer wavelengths were one, planetary nebulae. So this, this object is a planetary nebula detected at every wavelength we, we cross-matched with, which went from uh, Spitzer glimpse, three and a half microns, all the way out to uh, the Magpie's 20 centimeter catalog. Um, and you can see it you know, detected at every wavelength. The planetary nebula is producing an H2 region. It also has plenty of dust that it's producing. And for objects like this, perhaps the most interesting thing is we, we can probably learn something about the dust SED by adding in this, uh, this millimeter point with decent resolution. But these were not our prime targets. You know, for, for at least this first project, we treated planetary nebulae as contaminants, but interesting ones. Another interesting subset of sources is uh, OHIR stars. So again, this is it's a star, you can see it at short wavelengths, but at long wavelengths, it's totally absent. There is no, no centimeter detection, um, but we still do pick it up at three millimeters. So what we're seeing is just a pure dust spectrum. So again, we can learn something perhaps about what, uh, what dust is being produced by these OHIR stars. Um, but again, this was not the main target. This is just something that turns out to be a nice compact isolated source that's easy to pick out. What we're actually looking for in the pilot was um, hypercompact H2 regions. And so one um, set of criteria we used for that was to look for sources that showed up in the dust, uh, dust continuum, so at uh, in the Herschel bands and the millimeter bands, but dropped out once you got to centimeter bands, with the idea being that these sources may be uh, optically thick at three millimeters. And so their SED is dropping off more steeply than um, 
than the, the centimeter uh, wavelength surveys are capable of picking up. So these are the at least one subset of the candidate hypercompact H2 regions. We also did find some well-known hypercompact H2 regions, uh, such as this actually little cluster of sources uh, known as G34, um, where the, the source we found in the, the Mustang data are clearly seen in other wavelengths as well. Uh, the SED looks like junk because everything was, all the shorter wavelengths got saturated, but this is a well-known source. It, it's actually a pair, at least a pair of hypercompact H2 regions that were cataloged by uh, Marta Suilo back in uh, 2004. Um, so, okay, we were able to pick up the hypercompact H2 regions we were trying to, to look for in the survey. And as long as they're isolated enough, that was the problem. So that's encouraging. So we used the, our set of candidate hypercompact H2 regions, several known ones, and uh, uh, the uh, corresponding catalog of uh, ultra-compact H2 regions to try to get some constraints in the lifetime. So uh, we just take the hypercompact H2 region count, divide by the ultra-compact H2 region count over the same area, the same region, to get the uh, the lifetime ratio, and this is the this is the relative lifetime of hypercompact to ultra compact H2 regions, and it's a range of a sixth to a half, with you know, very very large error bars here. Don't want to overstate what we've done. We only found a handful of hypercompact H2 regions, and we go from the lower limit of uh, the ones that we're sure of to the upper limit of all the candidates. Um, but it still it gives you a range that says the hypercompact lifetime is less than the ultra compact. So if we want to actually turn that into a real lifetime, we can go to the latest uh, update on, on ultra compact H2 lifetimes. So we go to the Cornish survey and they say it's about 30,000 years. There are big error bars on this, but we're just going to stick with a single number for the purpose of illustration. That gives you a hyper compact H2 lifetime of five to 15,000 years. Um, so if you were to assume that you have a B0 star, that the, the star turns on, as, uh, as soon as it hits the B0 because the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale is short enough. That means, which is actually a little bit of a contradiction here because the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale is about 10,000 years, but uh, brush that under the rug for the moment. Uh, for this star to double its mass going through the hypercompact H2 region phase, that uh, if it's gonna do it in that limited time, that 15,000 years, it's gonna require an accretion rate of two to five to 10 to the minus three solar masses per year, which is a really high accretion rate. Um, that sort of accretion rate through an ionized flow probably isn't sustainable, which hints that maybe this is actually the, um, suggesting that uh, the stars are staying a, a little bit cooler and a little bit more bloated as they accrete, uh, even through the B0 and early O star phases. Well, for example. All right, so this was just our, our uh, you know, a general lifetime constraint uh, highlight. We can still do what we can do a lot better if we extend this to a much larger area. This is just from limited to those seven square degrees. Um, and particularly, you know, parts of the galactic center are, you, you might question how complete we are um, and, and how much the properties of, say, ultra compact H2 regions are different. All right. So the other thing we went through and did was uh, look at the, uh, the free free to dust ratio in these fields. So we were able to break the emission apart. And we found that the three millimeter emission consists mostly of free free emission, um, at least in the extended part. We didn't, we found a dust fraction, the highest dust fraction we found is only 20% over these square degree fields of view. And so now I want to show you a little bit about how we did that, how we broke it down. So I'm going to show you a series of plots, they're all the same, where the middle panel is the three millimeter, it's the observed data with Mustang. So this is a Mustang image in the center. On the left, we have the Atlas Gal 870 micron image. And on the right, we have a 20, 20 centimeter image uh, from one of the VLA imaging surveys. And we take the Atlas Gal data, we scale it down to three millimeters, uh, assuming a dust beta, and we subtract it off to get this image. So this is supposed to be our free free component of the three millimeter data. We do the same thing. We take the 20 centimeter, scale it by multiplying by one-ish, because it's, uh, it's, we assume it's a flat spectrum, subtract it from our three millimeter data, and end up with our three millimeter dust map. And you can see, okay, here's the brick, a well-known dust source, matches up quite well, and it disappears appropriately, excuse me, in this image. So we've got a nice breakdown of dust versus free free. Now, big caveat here, of course, is that there's a lot of synchrotron emission at 20 centimeters as well. 
So we do this for, this is uh, the, the arches region in the galactic center. Here's the Sagittarius B2 region. And you can see there's both dust and free free. There's some interesting features we saw, that we, we saw though when we looked at other parts of the galactic plane. So here, for example, is the G34 region up top. Okay, we have our hypercompactly shear region has both dust and free free, all good. But when we look at parts of the um, L equals 30-ish region, we see that if you take the three millimeter and subtract off the 20 centimeter, there appears to be an excess of 20 centimeter emission. Um, that's kind of hard to explain, right? There, there shouldn't be an excess of 20 centimeter emission unless there's synchrotron. There has to be something that's rising as you go to shorter wavelengths. And so there's this hint of seeing a synchrotron, extended synchrotron emission in H2 regions. In fact, we see that hint even more strongly when we look at the W43 region where you can see you know, the nice dust blob showing up here. There's the, the dust separates out well from the free free, but there's this negative region in the, the three millimeter minus 20 centimeter, which is hinting at the presence of, uh, of synchrotron in the H2 region. Actually, this one is G34. I mislabeled it. This, is, this one's not, this is some other region. <laughs> um, of course, we also looked at W49. So W49A, mix of dust and free free. W49B, our um, synchrotron emitting supernova remnant. Very clear. You know, this one we expect to see this negative feature. And of course, it does show up this way. So we're, we see a nice clear, um, like this is mislabeled. This is not actually free free emission. This is uh, just the supernova remnant. And then W51 as well has some signs that there might be some synchrotron emission in the extended H2 regions. All right, so one more thing we can do with the Mustang data is uh, compare it to larger scale. So this image is showing um, the Mustang data in green, uh, Atlas Gal in blue, there we go, yes, and 20 centimeter VLA in red. And what we did is we, we went in and combined the Mustang data with Planck data to fill in the short spacings. And you know, we get this actually very nice filled in um, higher resolution, but still recovering largest scales map. Now there's a caveat here. The Planck data have about 10 arc minute resolution and the large angular scale we recover with Mustang is only four arc minutes. So uh, there's a possibility in the future that the CMBS4 project will sort of fill in those intermediate spacings. But for now we can do the, you know, a similar thing that the Atlas Gal team has done in com combining with the large angular scale data to get a, a, a fully full spatial dynamic range map. We can also go the other way and look at combining the Mustang data with interferometer data. And so uh, there's a student, Danny Diaz, who's working with Roberto Galvan Madrid um, to combine our ALMA data with Mustang data. So this is an ALMA IMF image of W51 IRS2. And here's the Mustang image. And you combine them together and you see you're covering quite a lot more flux. You still keep the, the nice high resolution, but you're seeing you're recovering a lot of the uh, filtered out emission that the interferometer couldn't capture. And you can't do this with all the total power. And frankly, you can't do it with the seven meter rate either. Uh, you, you really need brain bank to, to um, get those larger scales in. And this is really important for telling you where, how the mass is distributed in these regions. All right, so there, there are also some future companion surveys we might look toward uh, to, to motivate uh, a Mustang Galactic Plane Survey. For example, LMT has the Aztec and Toltec uh, imagers that are going to make 10 and 15 arc second maps at one and two millimeters. Uh, Iram's Nika instrument has started mapping out big chunks of the galactic plane at similar resolution. Uh, and of course, there are going to be these Alma mosaics popping up everywhere in the galaxy. Alma IMF already has 15, but there are a lot more of them. Um, that they'll be looking to Green Bank to fill in those short spacings as well. So I will uh, leave you with a summary slide um, where we, you know, we have a few small science highlights from this pilot program. Uh, but the maps look great. Mustang 2 performed really well, and the Mustang team did a great job. Um, and there's there's just a lot of potential for it, uh, for extending this further. So with that, I am ready for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. If anyone has questions, please enter them in the Q and A uh, window. I don't see any in there now. Um, There's a hand raised, so um, oh, but I don't think you can. They can talk, can they? 
I don't you type it in, it's better. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just ask Adam while we're waiting, um, are there plans to continue the survey now? Yeah, we have submitted, resubmitted, uh, we, we've been submitting uh, every semester since uh, since 2012 or so uh, to try to get this time in. And so we do have a submission in now um, and we're just trying to get basically what I said, we're doing it um, in pieces because we can't, we don't want to take up all of the Green Bank um, three milliliter time, but we want to get as much as we can uh, each, um, each cycle. So yeah, absolutely, we're trying to extend it. Uh, we would also like to be able to go deeper in some regions. Uh, it, it's clear that we, we haven't, you know, we could afford to go deeper and we'd, we'd be able to see more if we did. So yes, short answer. We have a question here. Um, any plans to explore meerkat data for overlapping regions? I would love to um, have a look at meerkat data in the overlapping regions. I don't have access to any of that except a little bit in the galactic center. And indeed it would be really quite interesting to compare the Galactic Center meerkat data. Uh, I'll, I'll, I should point out the images that I was uh, showing you here, right? The 20 centimeter data um, that's in red, those come from uh, Farhad Yusuf Zada's uh, survey of the Galactic Center uh, from quite a while ago uh, with the VLA. And the meerkat data are a good deal more sensitive, I think higher resolution as well. Uh, being able to compare these side by side would almost certainly yield something interesting. And especially if we were able to get a, a spectral index map so we could separate out the free free and synchrotron a bit. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I don't have access. So if you'd like to collaborate on that, just yeah, contact me offline. So another uh, comment, um, Chandra observations can identify massive OBWR members of these distant star forming regions complementing long wavelength dust and gas observations. Absolutely. And I'll point out that I think, Eric, one of your favorite uh, regions, W51 IRS2E, is sitting right in there. Uh, and it's the, one of the more intriguing um, Chandra sources. So yes, there, there's definitely um, complementarity there. And uh, of course, Chandra has a, quite a bit better resolution. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, this is this in particular is a region where I think comparing the the, the st star population you see with Chandra to the dust emission with, uh, with Rain Bank is, is interesting. We have a, a minor correction. The LMT 50 meter diameter and Toltec will provide five and 10 arc second resolution at one and two millimeters respectively. All right, that is a, that's a good correction. So we'll go five and 10. Um, I think this is for the first pass when we're when we only have the 30 meters available. If the 50 meter full 50 meter is already available, then I, I stand oops, I stand corrected. Um, but I think we're gonna have some data at this resolution before we get that really optimal resolution. Okay. And um, we seem to have an offer of collaboration that you can deal with. <laughs> All right, great, James. I'll excellent, uh, an excellent outcome from these talks. Um, let me see if there's anything. There's a question about how precisely we know the beam shape at three millimeters, uh, uh, yes. including the side lobes and dependence on elevation. That's a good question and one I don't have the complete answer to. I can point out that we know there are some problems and I'm seeing if I can identify any of them in these images or if I picked Want. I may have, may have cherry picked the images that don't have problems. Uh, there's a little bit of, you can see some sort of side lobe issues around some of the brightest sources uh, that I unfortunately hid from you here. Um, you can maybe start, well, no, you can't see them here. You can see them in the main paper, uh, but around some of the brightest sources, you actually see some possibly side lobe related features. Uh, the beam shape, I suspect it's not that well known for Sagittarius B2, the galactic center. Uh, I think that's where, where it's not been characterized so well, but otherwise it is pretty well characterized. And I'd have to direct you to the uh, Mustang team to, uh, to give more details on that. Um, oh yeah, Brian said that they do a quick measurement of the beam every 30 minutes or so. And uh, so, so it's, it's reasonably well characterized, but yeah, just when we're, the Galactic Center, we were pushed to the limits a little bit. Um, I see our nodes question about how do we extrapolate the high frequency dust data down to three millimeters and what are we assuming about dust properties? Uh, 
that we did very simple assumptions. We just assumed beta equals 1.5. We assumed uh, that, assumed Rally genes, right? We assumed that the Atlas scale data was already following that nu to the minus two. And that works actually pretty well, right? Uh, we can do quite a lot better with well, full SED modeling, um, but for just the, the images I'm showing here, where we're just trying to sort of split out the dust from the free free, that worked actually quite well. Okay, is that does that finish our questions, I believe, active questions? Yeah. Okay, Adam, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for this really interesting presentation. And just remind everyone that this presentation will be available online through our website in a couple of days. And we will have another presentation in and another one of these webinars in two weeks. And the topic will be recent results from the Nanograv um, survey of pulsars for gravitational radiation. And so we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks and bye. All right, thanks all.